All right, and welcome to episode five of Magic and the Other Guy. So you know the format by now. There really isn't a format. And you know the other guy, my friend Kevin. So Kevin, what are we talking about today? Well, I had a bit of a curiosity. Uh, in your kitchen, you have a photograph of you playing American football. Yes. Back, I believe, in high, your high school era? Well, it was, uh, hang on, no, it was after, it was after school days in for me. England. It would have been about 1981, 82, 83. It was that era. And a new channel had started in UK. Channel 4, which goes to show just how many channels we had back then. <laughs> we had BBC One, BBC Two, uh, ITV, which is independent television, and then Channel 4 arrived in the early 80s. You now have 33% more options to watch. That's right. <laughs> and Channel 4 was kind of... Uh, it, it, it was struggling to find its place, I think, when it first started. It, it, was, it, it kind of wanted to... And I might be wrong here, but in my impression, it kind of wanted to be the alternative comedy scene of TV. Like, it didn't want to be the staid and steady, this is the BBC Broadcasting Corporation, and um, it didn't want to be independent television. It wanted to show alternative stuff. And one of the alternative sports that it started to show, along with sumo wrestling, which became reasonably popular. Well, we'll go from one side of the earth to the other and right. keep, keep them all going. That's right. Yeah, so sumo wrestling became popular. And then uh, I started to show the NFL. And all of a sudden, like American football, as it was known as in, in England, became very popular, I mean, you know. And um, leagues started to form. Um, and I started to train with, not particularly play games, because we were just, I mean, literally, we were just getting the teams off the ground. We're just getting a league up and running. We're just getting teams off the ground. And, I, and I, my affiliation was with uh, Nottingham, which is a town very close to where I grew up. And we called ourselves the Nottingham Hoods uh, from the Robin Hood connection. And, oh, and, and also the Hoods of you know, Chicago fame, if you like. We we're trying to make a bit of a connection there. Uh, so that was our team, the Nottingham Hoods. So was it just something that you just looked? It looked fun, so let's give it a go. Or is it yeah, it was absolutely that. Yeah, it, it, but again, it was all on the strength of having coverage, regular coverage of gridiron American football in England. Because prior to that, we only ever had the Super Bowl, and the Super Bowl was covered on the BBC in about fifteen seconds after the golf and the rugby and everything else. Oh, okay. You know? You know, sort of, and the, you know, whoever it was, let's say it's Miami Dolphins, and the Miami Dolphins have won the Super Bowl, you know, and that would be it, you know. And so that when we started getting regular coverage over it, um, the popularity of the sport really boomed. But talking about football, I never really managed to play in games. Uh, I did train with them, but unfortunately I injured my knee in, in a... Oh, well, there's a wonderful bird noise. Proof, as they say on Tis was in England, that this show is live. This show is live. <laughs> this show is live. The wildlife down at the lake make no concession for our recording. Yes, I injured my knee in, uh, uh, at work, and um, um, I got over it, but uh, it really kind of... I, I would soon realised that I had to protect my knee, and playing football was probably not the best thing to do. Uh, and so I became the team's commentator. Oh, well, it was my there, first. There's some, there's some uh, foreshadowing. Yeah, there you go. It became my first job at um, uh, as a commentator. They didn't have anybody, and um, they needed somebody to announce at the ground, and so that was my that was that was, that became my role. And uh, I think it's I think it was actually very useful because it gave me confidence speaking into a mic and speaking in front of a crowd, which, as you just alluded to there, in later years when Frank Wilson and Speed Vision invited me to come over in the States, I was already kind of comfortable oh, okay. working with a mic. Yeah, that's yeah. the first I've heard of that. Yeah. So. Yeah. So that's that's the uh, that's the story of of the uh, American football photograph. <laughs> Oh, my freezer in there, yeah. Yeah, I was just surprised to see American football. I mean, I'm sure at some point it did have to come over, but yeah. uh, that it would have been back then. But uh, And that's quite an undertaking because, I mean, like if you're spreading, like, say, you know, European football, soccer, yeah. to the world, that's easy. A ball and whatever we make is a couple of goals. But with football, you've got, a, you know, you've got a, all that equipment, and that's a lot of planning to yes. make a team and a lot of expense, too. It was a, it was a lot of planning. It was a lot of expense. But I, I would say that England really took to it in a, you know, in a sort of minor way. It's a, it's a minor interest sport in England. 
Um, <clears throat> excuse me, but we did get a league up and running. Uh, we got contacts in the States where we could buy equipment much cheaper if we bought it en masse mm-hmm. and then ship it over to England. And several teams were buying uh, sports equipment at the same time. And uh, so we did manage to make quite a success of it. But my, my team, back then and to this day, and for no other reason the fact that they were kind of the first team that I was watching, was what the team that used to be known as the Washington Redskins. Now I think they prefer to be known as just the Washington football team. Or yeah, Washington. Was the, things have been changing in the past few years with them, and I'm not sure exactly where yeah. they landed at this moment. I think they've done away with the Redskins. Uh, name has gone away. And, and most people... I would say over on the other side of the pond, and it always used to refer to Washington as simply Washington. Okay. Uh, and I see now they are the Washington, the Washington football team, which to me, I think it would be better if you just dropped the football team and just called it, called it Washington. But anyway, they were my team. Um, Theismann at quarterback, John Riggins at uh, fullback. Uh, and I remember watching, I think it was Super Bowl 17 between Washington and Miami. And just being amazed at John Riggins running the football, I thought, "This is this. I've taken to this sport. I like it. I like Good. it a lot." I was watching the strategy unfold, and to this day, I, you probably, you probably know that my memory is not the best, and it, it tends to sort of some things I remember and some things I don't. But to this day, I can tell you that the um, the Hogs lineup at Super Bowl Seventeen, I think, was Jacoby, Grimm, Bostic, Stark, and May. Jacoby being uh, left guard and right over to May on, on playing right guard. Why I remember that to this day? I was day? about to say, something stuck. <laughs> I know. <laughs> That's pretty it's, amazing. It's an odd thing that I remember that, but I always do, yeah. Now, so back with those uh, the teams, were they kind of like sponsored by maybe local businesses? Yes. Or kind of like Little Leagues are here? Exactly that, you know, that. that. Where they get a little bit of financing and a little bit of support and yes. we're able to make things happen? It was exactly that. We, we, we struggled to get any... Um, TV coverage, which is really what the league needed to advance. I mean, as they say, if it's not on TV, it doesn't exist. But we couldn't... Well, four channels, we, you don't have that many options right. still. We, and we the never, time is precious, I'm yes, sure. Yes, we never achieved that. We did get radio coverage. Um, but the league, and I remember back now, remember, we're going back a long way. So I'm trying to draw things out of my memory, I think. The league, I think, was the British American Football League. Um, and we would play against cities like Birmingham and Coventry and the Glasgow Lions would go up to Scotland to play Glasgow. Glasgow would come down to us. Very good. Uh, Birmingham Bulls were another big team, very powerful team. Um, and I think Leicester, as he called, if I remember right, the Leicester Panthers, curiously enough, as were in Charlotte, I'm sure they were the Panthers. Uh, but Birmingham Bulls, were known as the Birmingham Bulls because of the big shopping centre uh, in Birmingham, which is called the Bull Ring. Oh, okay. And so that was a you know, sort of logical. Do extension. they still exist and still have the same monikers? I want to say yes, but I've been so out of contact with it, I, I'm not sure. Um, but if you know, if you think to uh, uh, the NFL now, it's very apparent that interest in football still continues because games in the league, in the NFL, are still now regularly played in England. Yeah, every year, I think, you know, X amount go over yeah. there and do it. Ex- yeah. Well, it's not an exhibition, it's part of the season. Part but, of the but, season. But it's a chance for English fans to attend and, and, and see one yes, live. And, so that's, and the Panthers did it just maybe last year. Yeah. Um, and so the popularity of football has, without any doubt, continued. But I, I, would, you know, I would say that it all started... Back in 81, 82, 83, when Channel 4 had this incredible idea of, hey, why don't we show football games in England? Wow. Yeah, on the new well, TV station. I would imagine that, uh, you know, soccer, well, European football, is reigns supreme as the number one sure. sport. And is, would, is, yeah. is American football kind of second, or is there a baseball or something like that, or ba- anything else um, I might, might be thinking of that's very popular? Baseball. Now, if I remember my history right, Baseball actually was was reasonably popular in England uh, in the 1850s. Wow. Yes. And I think uh, Derby Soccer Club, Derby Football Club, play at the baseball ground. 
think I have that right. It's, it's, and again, this is what Google and Wikipedia is for. These dim me- memories are in there somewhere. You know, they're all based on facts somewhere. But I think Derby used to play at the, I think at the baseball ground, uh, from mm. the original baseball days. You know, okay. but but the sport of baseball died away completely uh, in terms of popularity in England. And um, well, you, you know, you chaps seem to have picked it up and done rather well with it. Yeah, I'm not sure when it was invented. I mean, there's obviously. People in the sports, I'll know exactly when Double Day invented the game, but I couldn't couldn't even tell you when it was. Yeah. So, how about cricket? Does cricket kind of fall in maybe second most popular there? Or yes. Is it still- yes. I mean, cricket is extremely popular in England. Um, so, in terms of popularity rankings, I mean, it, without any question, it's the Premier League, soccer, cricket, rugby. In that, yeah, would be in yeah, that yeah. that order. Yeah, rugby. We don't get a lot of that here. You know, there's right. definitely leagues and stuff like that. You know, yes. local, and I'm sure some of the, the universities and stuff have them as well. Yes, but I've only known personally one person that ever played it. So, yeah, uh, and, and rugby is reasonably reasonably po- uh, popular. Um, it's very popular in Wales. The Welsh love to play rugby. England are pretty good at it too, and French love to play rugby. Um, but if you look at the rules of rugby. And whether it's rugby league or rugby rugby union, the two the sort of different leagues that play, and then you look at how American football is played, you can see that you can see where the connection is. Yeah. There's no question of that. You know, you can see it was a it was a sort of natural expansion on what rugby was doing, and the one big change that really to me made American football American football was the one forward pass. Yes, it's the one thing we we I'd say we as in, as, as England. Don't, never introduced into rugby was a forward pass. It always had to be lateral or, or reverse, reverse pass. Reverse pass, yeah. Which we still see now when you watch, you know, watch football. Occasionally, you see one of those plays where the you know the ball are constantly sort of lateraled or passed yeah. back. Um, well, it puts a split second decision. It's like you know, yeah, do, we, do we reverse yeah. to, to hopefully advance or do we keep on advancing? Yes. It's, it is. Yes. It is a mind thing that has to take in a, yeah. in a millisecond. Decision. And then when you see. You know, I don't. I can't imagine for a second when the introduction of that one forward pass per play was introduced into football. I imagine that the the rule makers of the league at the time, and this is just me being fascinated by football. I imagine they could have had no idea of the change that would make to the flow of the game in football and the value of the quarterback and the speed of the uh, receivers to go downfield, etc. Oh yeah, I'm sure it did. Completely, completely changed the game, but. Uh, yeah, that was what that was. That was it. So I'm sure you can see a definite connection between rugby. Are there sep- in, in England? Are there separate stadiums for rugby, or do they share one with a soccer team? Usually? Separate stadiums. There's, really? Yes, there are right. separate stadiums. Yeah, yeah. It's a, it's a sport all unto itself. Um, it, I would say it's nowhere near as popular as soccer. But of course, if you're a rugby fan, I'm sure there are many rugby fans out there who say, "Steve, what are you talking about? It's extremely popular, you know." And it is. Yeah. It is extremely- and I've seen them touch on it on Top Gear and stuff like that. They'll do it with cars or something like that. You yes. Know? Yeah. Big, big guys, and, and you know, and I always think you see the injuries that rugby players pick up, and, and to me, it's a bit like ice hockey players. You know, they they they're injured in the course of the sport and accepted as part of the sport, but. It would only take a rule change in the introduction of a football-style helmet into rugby, and I'm sure a lot of injuries would be protected. In the same way that I always think with dear old hockey players, you see so many dental injuries because that part of the face is exposed. Oh, yeah. Well, um, it wasn't until too many years ago. I'm not sure how many years ago. It, it maybe I remember a couple of decades ago, where you could be grandfathered in. If you, started, you were, if you entered the league far enough back, you didn't have to wear a helmet still. You were grandfathered in. So you were still seeing guys on ice without yes. a helmet. Is they, that right? But they had their, if they were grandfathered in, they had the choice themselves <laughs> to decide whether or not to wear a helmet. Yes. And some of them didn't. Yes. Yeah. Now, again, I'm sure, I'm sure there are many people that want to be critical of what I'm about to say here. But I, I do believe it would only take a rule change. And uh, a, a full, you know, football-style mass to be introduced into ice hockey, and those problems would go away. Now, the, the current players may object to that, but I would always say this is the, it's the same thing as safety changes introduced into Formula One motor racing in our little world, you know, or any or any form of motor racing. That the idea of higher cockpit sides nobody liked until it happened, and everyone now accepts it. The idea of a, a cockpit bolster around the drivers neck and head each side of the cockpit nobody wanted until it happened and now it's accepted and now the introduction the most recent thing of course Kevin is the, is the halo oh the halo and so change. yeah I mean, and so many people were anti the halo until it was introduced um, 
drivers were critical of it, teams were critical of it, fans and supporters of the sport were, and to a degree I was too, you know, I'm not, again, I was thinking, well, is this a good thing? Can you get drivers out of the cockpit in time if, if you need to because of the halo? But within a couple of years of the halo being around, you just accept it. The drivers accept it as it is what it is. Yeah. And I feel that safety equipment in other sports, such as ice hockey, it would be accepted within one generation. The new players wouldn't know any different. Well, there's no question. You you kind of you kind of give some aesthetic to get safety, but that's that's you it's, know, yeah. It's a give and take. Players and drivers' yeah. lives are more important yeah, than yeah. The aesthetics. Yeah. So. Yeah. Even but, though it's an inherently dangerous sport on both of those, actually. So. Yeah, and again, I'm sure. Um, I'm sure many rug- fans of rugby and rugby players would disagree with my idea of introducing a football-style helmet. Uh, and I understand there is there is a, uh, the, there is some evidence I would suggest, or some th- theory that perhaps the introduction of the helmet has 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 led to injuries that weren't there before. I'm not in any. I don't know. I'm, I'm no expert on that. I, uh, perhaps the helmet has its own problems, but. Yeah, I, I mean, just I think in general, as as new safety measures come along in every sport, my I think my overriding point here really is, it only takes one generation, and and you just take it as red. It's, it exactly. just it, it just becomes part of the sport. Well, I mean, if you just look at what they were a hundred years ago, or even less than that, they were just these leather leather things with a little bit of thicker leather on top, and know. you know, like leather flying helmets. Right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. But uh, yeah, you mentioned you know earlier that you know kind of american football and sumo kind of come over at the same time that yeah. really reminded me in the states especially back you know before cable was introduced and you may, mainly had the three channels here your three main channels you know that we still have but the wide world of sports on abc was the big thing and it really brought in a lot that was their, what they were known for they would bring over and show us things we'd ne- maybe never see curling okay. maybe may on it or it yeah. might be sumo wrestling you know, and then it really took off with when Evil Knievel started doing his jumps. I think that was their big rating boost that really sent him skyrocketing. And occasionally, that's how I, I still remember, I'm sure, the first time or even whenever I would have a chance to see Formula One, it would be on Wide World of Sports. And usually it was Monaco. I still remember watching right. Monaco because you can definitely remember the hairpin. Yes. And I definitely remember that as yeah. a kid. And Jackie Stewart, you know, his voice always sends me right back. Well, he has, a, he has a unique delivery. Uh, I can't say a unique accent, a Scot- Scottish accent, but he has a u- unique delivery in motorsport where you can instantly recognize oh, yeah. Jackie's voice. I, yeah. I go straight back to being a kid and yeah. listening to him. And then speaking of Wild World of Sports, Jim McKay yeah. was the voice, and he also voiced the Olympics. So for so many years, I would hear his voice and think, you know, think of the Olympics, and it's so sad we don't have him still broadcasting. Yes, but it, it, is, it is fun, I think, to delve into the sports of different nationalities, different countries, and, and just kind of study it and see where it started, the origins of it. Yeah, I mean, I can watch a little bit of sumo wrestling. I'm not going to watch it for hours because I'm not that into it, but I, I'm, I'm kind of fascinated by the history of it. And Oh, it's got a deep, deep, rich yes, history in, yeah. in Japan and such. Yeah. Yeah. So did did you play did you play football as a younger man or um, um, baseball as a younger man? Or? I did one year of little league football, pee wee football, whatever you want to call it, in '76. Right. Okay. And it was mostly because some friends, you know, at school, elementary, were, were doing it, and I kind of okay, I'll give it a try too. Found out it wasn't my thing. I just really didn't care that much about it. Uh, I did that season. Um, didn't do baseball. Um, I was more independent and just liked to ride. I liked bikes, and I did you know BMX bikes, but I did r- race them. But I you know, always had one, and we'd yeah. be finding something to jump and try to kill ourselves. <laughs> and then uh, that evolved into skateboarding. Yes. Uh, but about junior high, I started you know kind of transitioning from biking into you know doing skateboarding. And I'd go about every day uh, and do something in the driveway, or it might be this certain parking lot. Uh, in uh, Leesburg was called the Unevens because it was just built different levels and okay. it had you know elevating like ramps to it right. and it was just a great place to congregate so I would skateboard now I did actually I competed in I think three skateboard competitions but organized sports just weren't my thing which is kind of funny because my dad um, he loved baseball of course growing up you know in that you know depression era beyond you know baseball was such a big important thing you know yeah. being the national pastime and he loved to play. Anytime they had a you know few minutes free time, they would grab their their bats and gloves and head off to some sand lot, just like you know the famous movie kind of alludes right. to. Um, so he grew up doing that, uh, and he was also a, a champion tennis player. Oh wow! In his later years, mostly like college age, 
Um, he was a citywide champion. And the, the funny one is when he was younger than that, probably uh, 10, 11, right in there, he was a marbles champion yeah. for the city. So they used to play marbles back wow. in the day you know, yeah. as kids. Yeah. So he did that. A, a marbles champion. Yeah. Yeah. We have the uh, newspaper. <laughs> we have the newspaper clipping of where he was the uh, city champion wow, of playing fantastic. marbles, and we actually still have some of his original marbles yeah. from way back in the day. Well, we. I mean, we used to play marbles on the other side of the Atlantic in England, but um, I'm not aware of anybody being a mar- a marble champion. Certainly not in my day of playing school games. Now, one thing I do know that you're very into uh, in, in in terms of sport because. I remember when we were in Florida doing one of our uh, uh, dinner reading events and we we walked past uh, a little surf shop and your eyes lit up of, of what were in there. And I know that you're a big fan of, of surfing. So tell me about tell me about that. What when did you suddenly become enthralled with everything to do with surf? Uh, that happened. We moved we moved uh, from Tennessee to Central Florida uh, in early early 81 and i think just evolved from you know being down there in florida kind of near the coast we were still about 45 minutes drive living there but i think it started more or less the skateboarding first and that kind of evolved you kind of hang around people that skateboard and they're also kind of you know surfer guys too and it just kind of evolved and then wasn't too long before we were able to drive so then we could just on a saturday we're heading to the beach for the day you know we pile in but it's just like anything else, you know, I'm not going to run out and buy a brand new surfboard. You know, he didn't have money you know, sure. for that. So right. it seems like I got my first one from the local pawn shop. And it was just a real, not a good one, <laughs> but it kind of got me going. And then, yeah. you know, whenever, you know, that was Prius driving. So we have, it would be when your parents are going or a friend may be going, you could tag along or something like that. So we started, you know, kind of going over there. When we could on the weekends. And, of course, all of us by then had a decent board and stuff like that, yeah. so we would ride. But then I graduated high school and went back to Tennessee for college, but ended up moving back to Jacksonville where, you know, I even showed you the place where I lived there on the beach. Yeah. And within a three days of moving to that spot, I went and found a board and bought one. And so, you know, we lived, we lived right on the water, so it was great. A lot of times I'd do it after work. I'd come in and, you know, on a nice summer afternoon uh after work you know the light was still you know till like eight or nine o'clock and if the waves were good i'd go out after after dinner time and and ride a little bit i was never never great at it but it was was really that's the thing isn't it you took to it and that becomes your thing i think that's important yeah i remember when you showed me your your old apartment building a fantastic spot down there and a little walk over the sand and, and there you are, this fantastic beach over there. Oh, yeah. Now, right I also right. noticed, you know, because I, I, I'm, always, I'm always keen to learn new things. And I remember when you were talking to the shop owner, looking at the surfboards, the one, one phrase that kept popping up in conversation I was unfamiliar with, was it, was it shaping? Who shaped the board? Is that how you describe it? Oh, yeah, yeah. yeah. Every, most, every good board is done by a shaper. and there's A shaper. Yeah, yeah. and that's, a lot of times their name is on the board. Like back in the day, there was Dewey Weber and, and folks like that, and they, would, they take a, a piece of foam, and I think, I think the main one, is, the Clark foam is, is the main. I think almost most, if not all of them, these days are made from that, and they'll just take that piece of foam and just start shaping it and there's different shapes for different type of waves and sizes yeah. and and uh there's shorties and longer ones and so you know, you'd buy one's made for big waves and one's not and such so a sh- a shaper would buy a block of particularly hard foam i'm guessing then to shape it to form Correct. it mm-hmm. and, and and form it into or shape it into whatever particular design he or she's looking for and then some sort of product must be applied to fiberglass. it. Fiberglass. Just okay. It's fiberglass and fiberglass resin over the top yep. of it to seal it. Yep. You so lay you, down the, right. the cloth, the fiberglass. Okay. And then you just literally pour it across. I've never actually. It'd be great. I've never been inside of a of a shop when one is yeah. doing that. Of yeah. course, when they're shaping the foam, uh, you have to pour a full breather mask because it's just foam everywhere. Uh, little yeah. little, little yeah. pieces of uh, people that flying everywhere while, as you're yeah. taking it down. But uh, yeah, they're all. Hand done. It's definitely a craft. I mean, it's it's amazing what some of them have done. And, and are you or folks that are really into surfing? Can you look at a board and say, "I know who shaped that. I know, I know that." 
probably. Yeah. I, I couldn't I couldn't do it, and yeah, I don't but, know anyone yeah, right. particularly that could could say yes, I can do that. But the guys the guys and gals that are doing it professionally, they'd be able to say. Oh, I know where that came from. Yeah, yeah. And usually they'll uh, there'll be some sort of like little, little little penciled marks on the bottom of it, what, what size it is, and and they'll yeah. put down the little information, and it'll be under the fiberglass, you know, there forever, saying you know what size they did yeah. or, or whatever. But and they're, they're, I'm going to guess that there must be a collector's market for I'm going to say old surfboards. I don't know if that's right. Classic surfboards in the same way that there is of oh, very anything much so. else in the world that folks very much get so. into. Yeah. Of course, you know, you'll see, definitely see collectors and people that are passionate are more like, you know, on the California coast, maybe the Florida. You're not going to see that much in Charlotte, North Carolina. But uh, not that there isn't somebody that might be interested. You just don't see the collections that we're going to end up here because it doesn't make sense. We're inland. Right. <laughs> But I'm sure there's some. I can't. Yeah. I can't. There's probably. I'm sure some that are worth tens of thousands of dollars. Wow. Yeah. Yeah, and also there's a there's a tremendous lifestyle that goes all around. You know, with surfing. Oh, very much so. Yeah, yeah. Did you take to all of that as a young man too? I mean, somewhat. By the time you know, again, we were in Central Florida, and we skateboarded mostly because, again, we could do that right outside our yeah. <laughs> driveway. You yeah. know, uh, so we did that mostly, and it was a bit of a drive. But you were just one, you were kind of in that group. You yes. Know? Uh, the, I, I noticed that going to high school in Florida, you were you were kind of clicked in part of a, a group. Yes. You know, and I was part of the surfer skater group back in my day. Yeah. And so you know, most everybody I knew, we would get together and skateboard. You know, in the afternoons, and some of the same of, of us would break off and maybe go to the beach on Saturday and come back and stuff like that. But again, you know, we still had high school and responsibilities and jobs and parents going, "Well, you're not going today," <laughs> you know, that kind of thing. Of course, but, yeah, yeah. So I mean, we talked about football, and I would have been twenty, twenty-two when we when I was playing uh, American football in England. Um, but organized sports in my my life. Other than motor racing, which is a you know well understood part of my my life, um, I never really took to team sports really because, and this is something we're bound to get into in a, as a on, a on a later episode. I I was fairly isolated as a kid, in, in just in terms of where I lived and where my friends were. So I ended up uh, being on my own a lot of the time, and so organised group sports. You know, it just became it's just difficult to happen. You know, yeah. I had to get to somewhere. I had to physically travel to somewhere. And that, well, that that wasn't the easiest thing to do when I was a kid. So I I tended to do a lot of things uh, on my own. So I I took to uh, hiking and camping were really the things that I, I always loved to be outside, uh, which is one of the reasons we have to say why we decided to do uh, Matchett and the other guy the podcast <laughs> outside because I just like to be outside oh, with agree. the sound of the the wildlife, you know, and the and the beautiful lake out here, but. So as a kid, as a, as a, even as a very young kid, I, I would be camping in the woods on my own um, and would build, you know, what we call dens, you know, out of just ferns and bracken and branches. And um, I spent a lot of time on my own, but particularly, I particularly enjoyed camping. And then, of course, as a natural extension for that, hiking. And I still enjoy that now. You know, we have some great trails around here, up around Crowder's Mountain. And uh, I, I, still, I still enjoy that very much. Yeah, this is a beautiful part of the country with many, many options yeah. of, of, of things to do outdoors. The only problem I have, Kevin, really, um, I enjoy Charlotte very much. But... The high humidity of the summer, June, July, August, it, it, to me, it's almost crippling. Like you can't step out. You oh, can't yeah. step welcome outside. To the, welcome to the southeast. Yeah, we, it's just like being in a sauna. So, and it's ninety degrees, hundred degrees. I must say. So you're you saying know, it's a bit different than England. A bit different to England. That's exactly right. And at fifty-eight, um, I just you know I can't. I you know I, I have no desire to to walk up those steep inclines at fifty-eight in that high humidity, but. Um, but it does pay off when the fall comes. Yes, it's for spring too. Now, spring is yeah. beautiful usually. I mean, even now today, you know, we're, we're we're sitting here. We've had a lot of rain over over the weekend, um, and the powers that be, the guardians of of Lake Wiley, if they expect a lot of rain, they tend to lower the height of the lake by controlling the dams at each end of the lake, and the lake system in in Charlotte anyway. And the, I noticed the other day that the height of the lake. Uh, the water level had dropped at least three, maybe four feet. So clearly we're expecting a lot of rain. But sure enough, over the last 48 hours, we've had some torrential rain. And uh, it, it's raised the water level uh, back up now. But um, 
Yeah, be- it's beautiful here. Beautiful full colours. You're absolutely right. The reds, the greens, the golds. Just outstanding countryside for walking. And without that humidity, when you can feel the air going in and out of one's lungs when you're walking, I think is a great thing. Oh, absolutely. Mm. Yeah, we... Uh my camping experience, we didn't do too much. My family wasn't into camping, so I did a little bit. It's kind of hard to call it camping, but with the Cub Scouts. Yes. Um, yeah. I did Cub Scouts for a number of, a number of years, and then the, the middle one between that and Boy Scouts called Weeblos. Okay. And I did Weeblos for a while, and we would do what you call jamborees, and it's where like a whole bunch of scouts from different regions get together, yeah. and it's a big <laughs> yeah. party. So you're not like out in the woods you know, with like five of you. You're right. there with a couple of hundred maybe. So I remember doing those. But you, you slept in a tent, so that's about as close as it got to camping. Yeah. But uh, we just just as I was moving from from uh, Tennessee to Florida, it would have been about the time I would have graduated up to Boy Scouts, and I just having a transition and stuff. It's just like I'm just I'm going to end it. I'm not going to pursue it down there. And then, lo and behold, I did get into you know riding the BMX bikes, and which led to the and eventually the skateboarding and then surfing. So that was kind of what I did all through. Through high school, and then of course, like say when you could drive, the the bike kind of found its way into the back of the sure. storage barn because yeah. I never needed it again, it hardly. Out. Not that That's I did, wouldn't. Yeah. yeah, I'd get it out every once in a while and just yeah. kick around on it. But skateboarding was great because you could go to the places you wanted to go to. We right. just always, I literally, I always had it in the trunk because yes. you know it would go to high school with me, and then wherever I was going in the afternoon or whatever. And generally, if I needed to or ran into some friends that were skating, I had it in the back, so it was always with me. And of course, surfing you just made more of a plan. You know, I'd load them up on top of the car and and head to the beach. But yeah, great, great, great times. I mean, I remember thinking about camping, and um, I, was, I was a Cub Scout too. Uh, my brother was a was a scout. Um, but I remember one of my greatest achievements. And this sounds a bit weird, but you know, <laughs> I've had some great great fortune in terms of my career. Um, probably culminating in, in being a part of the team that won the Formula One Constructors' Championship in 1995, which is, must stand out as my career highlight. And, but as a personal highlight, I would say the best thing I ever managed to achieve for myself was making a campfire without any matches or without any lighter, actually making a fire start with, with sticks. Hey, you know. that's an accomplishment. Yes, it wasn't really sticks. Not many of us can say that. It was bamboo, uh, two pieces of bamboo and learning how to uh, start a fire, a friction fire with bamboo and going through the process of sharpening the edge on a piece of bamboo uh, to use it as a, a, a low friction area and then cutting a little hole in the other piece of bamboo and generating a tiny ember. But I tried and tried. It's a bit like the film Castaway. You know, I, Tom I thought about that tried exactly and tried and tried and, tried and failed and failed and failed. But I kept persevering and persevering and persevering. And eventually, when you see that first tiny whiff of smoke and that tiny red ember and, and your nose smells that something is burning, even if it's just a little smoke at first, the, the, the rush of excitement and then to actually see the woof when it bursts into flame. I can remember it to this day. It's just, just a fabulous thing. And it's a skill that I've always kept. So whenever I get the opportunity, when I go camping now or even sometimes when I go to an organized uh, picnic barbecue area, which we have a lot of them around here, um, for a barbecue, you know, to cook out at lunch, for example, I will try and light the, light the fire just with bamboo. You know, so I'm, I'm very pleased to be able to do that. But I just remember that what it, uh, as a personal sort of sense of achievement. Wow. Bring a, bring a little primal dawn of man back to uh, some modern times. <laughs> That's right. Yeah. The first technology, as they say, right? The first technology. You master fire and away you go. Yeah. Beautiful, beautiful memories from childhood. Great to talk about different sports. Yeah. Playing American football in England as a 20 year old and. Um, all from that photograph that you saw in the kitchen. Yeah, it's it's great times. And again, that led to commentary and gave me the confidence to stand in front of a crowd and to um, to be comfortable talking with a microphone and and just share stories. And that's you know once again that's what we've done here today, gentle reader. And thank you for joining us for this episode. That was episode five, Kevin, wasn't it? Correct. Yeah. And join us again for episode six in the near future. Until next time. Bye.